So it's called um, algorithmetics. It's a word I created on the spot when I was asked to give a title. Yeah, and um, it's, uh, it's written specially. It's written with ethics with H at the end. There we are. Good. So it's all about that, exactly, uh, about the ethics of algorithms. And I hope this works. What do I do with that? Oh, well, <clears throat> there we go. All right, so what would that, what would that imply? Uh, there are three ways of understanding the relationship between algorithms and ethics. One of them is the ethics of using algorithms, which is discussed quite a bit around the issue, for example, of how much algorithms are actually helping out of their jobs a lot of people. That's one of the aspects of using algorithms in society. They actually replace manpower. The second one is ethics of behavior as effects of algorithms, which is the way we are ourselves totally dependent or getting to be very dependent on, on algorithmic calculation. And then the one which is the most interesting is ethics embedded in the algorithm, which is another uh, very strong drive into artificial intelligence. We're going through an epistemological mutation. I suppose all of us have had that intuition one way or the other. But the, one of the definitions that is going on now is that we're moving from the logical, which is the consequential series of arguments that go into a conclusion or a decision, into the ecological, which, by which I don't mean the environment, by which I mean many, 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 many uh, parameters driven by big data that bring you to make your decision. A third thing that's happening is, of course, the fake news. A fake news is part of this transition. And why is it part of this transition? Because what we are witnessing in fake news is the disappearance of the need for the referent. In the triad of the sign that was created by, uh, was created by uh, Ferdinand de Saussure, you have the relationship between the signifier, anything that you see that may have a meaning, and then the signified, which is what that sign is actually referring to as a concept. But in fact, what that concept itself refers to is something in reality. It may be an object or it can be an, an, another idea, but it exists outside of the frame of reference uh, immediately uh, contained into the sign. What the disappearance of the reference makes is that people don't care, and in fact, there, was, there has been in the description of this session, uh, that people have lost real interest in the veracity of statements. Well, yes, there is a kind of a conflation of the objective and the subjective when you start voting for people on the basis not of what you think should be the best government, but how you feel the person should be. That's, I'm not going to go any further into that, but what is leading us to is a, is a strange kind of datacracy. And this is how the Big data and, uh, is becoming the cognitive content of the whole of humanity on Earth. And what you are seeing here are all the progress from now, from uh, the 70s to, to now, of the various intelligent, artificial intelligent techniques that are not necessarily all related directly to the production of artificial intelligence, but that show and move extraordinarily rapidly towards a very strong development of artificial intelligence. And one of its consequences, which is up there, uh, is the anticipatory uh, analytics. What is happening now is that we are moving our, the vector of time that we carry within us in our psychological an emotional experience is moving from past-oriented or present experience to future expected. So we began with a low complexity reporting on what happened, then we became more clever and started analyzing, then we uh, monitored what was going on, predicting, and then of course simulating now what will happen. So this is a very different way of looking at time and experiencing time. A very good book just came out, and I translated it because I thought it was so good, Il Mondo Dato by Cosimo Akoto, and he says predictive analysis is the condition that emerges from the intersection of data and algorithms is the anticipation, the ability of the new sensorial and cognitive apparatus to anticipate with a feed-forward mechanism events and behaviors. 
The prolapses, the orientation towards the future requires amplification, automation, and constant updating, even if invisible to the human, as they are produced by autonomous and automated technologies. And what happens now is what we call ambient uh, artificial intelligence, which is taken over by Google and by uh, several other companies that they're actually combining together to create this ambient artificial intelligence, which is another thing from what we also call the artificial general intelligence, which we haven't achieved yet, but she's supposed to make artificial intelligence emulate very, very clearly the human intelligence. What would the algorithmic bias be there? As machines are able to harvest more data from their environment and to process those data, creating a model of the environment and perceiving their role interaction with the environment, they are shifting from being passive to becoming active towards an understanding of the environment. That's a statement that I contributed to because I am part of a research group on the uh, symbiotic autonomous systems, and we're pushing out a white paper now on exactly what, how we relate to these machines which are doing stuff for us that, <laughs> you know, we're not getting to take for granted. The, uh, Commissioner Viola made a mention of China. Uh, this is what I call datacracy. When, depending on data that is picked up from the user of your cell phone or from whatever kind of information previously in a database concerning you, in a previous session we were talking about reclaiming control of our data, that's not going to happen in China. Because what happens is that they actually have all the stuff you see above there, the, uh, all, the, all the part which is on top, as data which allows or doesn't allow all the benefits that come in under it. And what uh, Commissioner Viola said uh, was, was correct. It's a very, it's a very uh, dangerous kind of direction to follow. But worse than that is the games that they have made out of it. Now your neighbors, your family, your friends or not friends can actually suss you out and can actually evaluate what, your behavior. It's a game, it's presented as a game, but basically what it does is it, it eliminates the need for a lot of policing. We're having a new self-censorship kind of system. So that's a very strong, very strong issue. Here was my argument about uh, the loss of the referent. The loss of referent in alternate truth. Remember, it's been, <laughs> it's been described, I read recently, that the famous alternate truth, which was the fact that at the opening or the, in the, the inauguration of Donald Trump, there were more people in the mall of Washington than, uh, than for Obama, was actually ordered by Trump himself. He actually asked to redesign the actual number of people that seemed to appear on that thing, faking absolutely that news. So, there we are, the conflation of the subjective and the objective, when you can actually not care at all about the reference, at all about what's going on, simply make the statement and declare it truth. So, from the official blurb that introduced me to the theme that we were talking about, is from the Arts Electronica, in a mediascape where the average user couldn't care less about the veracity of the sources, who is responsible for regulating the distinction between true and false? What's art got to do with it? Anyway, that's, that was the point. The idea is that art is supposed to help us out, and maybe it will. And maybe you will not agree with my definition of art in this particular case, but I was fascinated to learn about this program invented by a woman called, um, I forgot her name now, and I didn't put it up there. Doesn't matter. Uh, Replica is a system, or it's a, it's a software, that allows you to create a companion who will respond to your characteristics and will engage and learn with machine learning more and more about you so that the kind of conversation you engage with will actually become more and more uh, relevant to you. How did this happen? This woman lost her friend, and he died, and she was already working on a software that would allow people to create their, a, a kind of companion. She took the very large database of exchanges that she had with that person in order to process that particular kind of sensibility that corresponded to him. And so she then started doing this in, a, in order to somehow have a, a more intimate memory of the man that she loved. 
But eventually, and this is where the art side of it becomes a little bit tricky, uh, it became much more of a commercial uh, system, and you can actually download Replica, and you can start your own friend, and two million people have already done it, so you'll be in, in good company. Uh, yeah, here's her name, uh, Virginia Cuida. Uh, now, other systems like Wobot, the Chatbot, and so on, uh, have, have uh, appeared after that. I am your artistic replica, you can decide later whether that's correct or not. But I have another, I have another <laughs> statement to make here, which probably will make me never invite at that Ars Electronica again, because this is popular culture, of course, and can we consider it as an art form? Absolutely. And particularly an art form around error. How many of you have seen anything from Black Mirror? All right, so... We have a cultured audience here. Why do I consider Black Mirror an art form? Well, it's, a, it's very much around the idea of an error that actually is like the hubris of the old tragedy. And in fact, our cinema productions is all about Greek tragedy. It's all about our problems. It's all about actually airing in the public the kind of situation that happened in the, in the context of our actual history as it's unfolding. So here you see uh, on, the on the top left, uh, it's an attack of drones, and there are bees, but the fact is, it's real because there are people making those bees now, not to attack people, but to actually replace those wh which are not pollinating anymore our, uh, our flowers. Uh, on the right, self-driving cars. We have a case of an accident with a pizza delivery, and of course, all the consequences of that. Uh, on the right, probably the most prophetic one because it came before the uh, plan of China was known, this woman goes to her room by being totally obsessed, as many of us are, uh, myself included, by the ratings or whatever it is that people think about you on her system, uh, cell phone. Uh, and then she ends up being absolutely ruined by this. On the left of the error, you have the woman who has, and this is again very much like replica, this woman's husband just was killed in a car accident because he was watching his <laughs> cell phone instead of driving, uh, and she too is, uh, receives a message from a company that tells her, we can reconstitute for you the sensibility and the personality of your husband, and she goes, well, sure. She starts, she does uh, start going. It's wonderful at first. Yes, it seems to be really him. But the next thing, a body in plastic is brought to her house, and that's the body of her husband. And that body is capable of moving like a person. And so she starts living with this person. And again, it seems OK, but there's something missing. Anyway, I won't just spoil it for you. Go ahead, go and see it. Uh, on the, on, at the bottom, you have a man totally obsessed by our virtual reality. Uh, that's banal, but never it is. On the right, you have a horrible machine, which is uh, uh, one of these robotic dogs that instead of doing its, do uh, its, uh, its dog uh, work of uh, protecting the house, is actually uh, sussed on to a person and keeps running after that person. It's absolutely horrifying. So the point is, when we're dealing with uh, algorithm ethics, ethics rather, uh, what have we got? Who's helping on this matter? Well, we know the formal one. The formal form was Isaac Asimov. You know, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. A robot must obey orders given by a human being unless it conflicts with the first law. A robot must protect its own existence as long as the protection won't conflict with the first and the second law. That's the basis from which very many new kind of, I'd say, a draft, uh, principles have been uh, driven. Uh, the Korean law adds something very interesting. Robots are afforded the following fundamental rights. The right to exist without fear of injury or death. That's pushing it forward. You know, it's a machine after all. The right to live in existence free from systematic abuse. Another very interesting question. We, we can understand this for dogs. Do we understand this the same way for robots? Then you have 10 uh, principles, which I'm not going to go through because there is a lot more. There is principles for accountable algorithms and a social impact statement of, for algorithms. Responsibility. Who has responsibility? Explainability. You have to ask your system, your algorithms, to actually explain themselves. Uh, accuracy. Be clear on what they do and what they cannot do. Auditability. You can submit your algorithmic uh, process to an auditing 
service, and of course, fairness. And it goes on. Here is the uh, Association of Computing Machinery, Principle for Algorithmic Transparency and Accountability. And then it goes on. Here is Bertelsmann Stiftung. And then here it goes on again, as we as you will our AI principle. So we're not alone. Obviously, we are, we, are, we are getting some help. But then when you think about it, you ask yourself, what can be programmed and what can't? What can be monitored? So Asimov's, Japan, South Korean rules, distant early warning reports, reports on data source and procedures used, all that can be somehow programmed and you can actually get away with your artificial intelligence. But what can't be programmed is judgment. I don't care what they say about decision supporting uh, systems. It is not ever going to be able to replace human judgment. Feeling, I, I know we are putting you know, effective computing in courts and so on, but I don't trust uh, you know, anything but a system of simulation. Self-awareness, yes, they talk about self-awareness of, of, of the artificial intelligence. Well, it's, it's true, it's, but it's only on the basis of internal scanning of the functions as they are, as they are proceeding. So I don't trust it. And more than anything else, I don't trust the spontaneity, except, of course, from unpredicted behavior. So my last statement, and I don't have a slide for it, but is for the artist in this room, you are, and we heard again from the Commissioner Viola, uh, the suggestion that art could be helpful in this particular case, you are now responsible for dealing with artificial intelligence and uh, algorithmics, uh, algorithmetics, because, in fact, you will know better probably the human effect of this. And in fact, the, the role of art is to predict the effect of technologies as they're coming in our life. Thank you.